Uh, we're still waiting for one more individual to uh, come down for quorum, so we may stop and uh, call the roll when we have uh, quorum present. Uh, we will begin uh, with a uh, public hearing for Senate Bill 1125. Uh, Senator Brown may proceed when ready. Uh, I will remind everyone both good news and the bad news. The bad news is it's a hearing on a Senate bill in April, uh, but the good news is that it's also a hearing on a Senate bill in April, and so we appreciate all the witnesses keeping that in mind as they uh, testify this morning as well. And with that, uh, Senator, please proceed when ready. It's also a great bill. For the record, my name is Ben Brown, State Senator for the 26th District. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 1125. Senate Bill 1125 addresses the phenomenon of DEI loyalty oaths that have become prevalent as prerequisite to employment at several Missouri universities. <clears throat> Under this act, public institutions of post-secondary education shall not require any applicant, student, employee, or contractor to submit a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. Public institutions of post-secondary education are further prohibited from giving preferential consideration and admissions or employment on the basis of individuals or an entity submission of an unsolicited statement relating to a discriminatory ideology. DEI statements are not designed to identify teachers who have experience supporting disadvantaged students. They've been used as a political litmus test, serving as screens for professors who put a partisan political agenda above the research or teaching enterprise. Candidates are often asked to describe how their teaching philosophy, research agenda, and service interests advance DEI, a highly ideological agenda. In other words, they're expected to commit to shaping their teaching and research priorities to DEI's radical ideology. ideology. This diverts faculty energy away from teaching and research and places it more on political indoctrination. Would we rather have Missouri biologists focusing their time and energy on politics or on advancing science and medicine? Hiring practices like those required in these loyalty oaths could also discourage highly qualified subject matter experts from even applying for jobs that have no or should have no political or social justice component. Florida is in the process of uprooting this sort of caustic academic culture entirely dismantling DEI programs in colleges and universities statewide. Do Missouri taxpayers really want to cede qualified, conservative, and moderate professors to states like Florida? I don't think so. It's important to note that the provisions of the Act do not restrict academic research or coursework, nor does the Act prevent an institution from requiring an applicant to discuss the content of their research or artistic creations. By eliminating DEI loyalty oaths, we can help restore these institutions to their intended purpose, challenging students in a way that pragmatically prepares them for the real world through the pursuit of truth, knowledge, and promoting diversity of thought. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Any questions for the bill sponsor from the committee? Uh, I have one. This does just apply to public institutions, correct, not private institutions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Any further questions for the bill sponsor from the committee? Seeing none. Witnesses here testify in support, Senate Bill 1125. Please come forward, make sure you fill out a witness card, and proceed when ready. Good morning. Honorable, mem Honorable members of the Select Committee on Empowering Missouri Parents and Children, my name is Raheem Williams. I am a senior fellow with Do No Harm Action. I am here to address the issue of loyalty oaths within Missouri's public universities. The practice of requiring loyalty oaths from educators has a deep and troubling history. Initially appearing during World War I, these oaths gained prominence in the post-World War period and were further intensified during the Cold War McCarthyism era. These measures were used as tools for ideological control, often under the guise of national security. During the McCarthy era, loyalty oaths were not mere affirmations of 
allegiance to the United States. They became mechanisms for limiting academic freedom and stifling free thought. Educators were compelled to prove subjective notions of patriotism through oaths that effectively curtailed their rights to free speech and free associations, fundamental principles of the academy and also fundamental principles of our nation. The resurgency of loyalty oaths today under the guise of diversity, equity, and inclusion is a disturbing echo from the past. This new spin on a new liberal practice requires faculty and prospective hires or employees to affirm certain ideological positions or deny others under the under the threat of professional ostracization. DEI is divisive and ineffective. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, FIRE, is surveyed over 1,400 faculty members across the United States, and they found them to be evenly split on whether DEI statements are justifiable requirements for a university job or an ideological litmus test that violates academic freedom. It was perfectly 50-50 down the middle. Three and four liberal faculty support mandatory diversity statements, while 90% of conservative faculty and 56% of moderate faculty see them as political litmus tests. Similarly, the survey found that faculty who do consider DEI statements requirements justifiable are also more likely to support the college or university administration investigating colleagues for controversial expression and less likely to think the administration should actively defend a colleague's free speech rights. DEI alienates qualified educators, stifles innovative teaching methods, and suppress the intellectual diversity that drives academic and societal progress. Moreover, it poses a clear threat to the First Amendment rights of those within the academic community and may needlessly create new legal liability. This isn't purely hypothetical. This is playing out in the real world. Former DEI college director and current Do No Harm senior fellow, Tabia Lee, was fired from her DEI job for not propagating racially divisive narratives that attacked whites and labeled Jews as oppressors. This sentiment has infected college campuses nationwide and most notably at our Ivy League institutions. As a member of the Open Expression Committee at the University of Pennsylvania, I have had front row seats to the impacts of this divisive ideology. Both professors and students are openly punished for wrong think while the school ironically claims free speech protections in its written policies. I have often found myself self-censoring after being ostracized for conservative positions. DI isn't diverse, it isn't equitable, and it isn't inclusive. The entire term is a dog whistle used to protect rigid and increasingly radical campus orthodoxy. Loyalty oaths erode intellectual freedom and have no place in higher education. We must learn from our history and recognize the strength of our of our national character does not depend on uniformity of thought, but on freedom to dissent and discuss diver diverse viewpoints. Therefore, I respectfully urge you to pass SB 1125 for, for the implementation and enfor or to prevent the implementation and enforcement of such oaths. Thank you for your attention on this crucial matter. Questions for the bill sponsor, uh, Senator Canning, then Senator Ryder. Um, is there any is there any studies showing that DEI has worked anywhere to make the university system work any better anywhere? So DEI is a all-encompassing term, right? So this bill specifically deals with loyalty oaths, but they kind of go hand in hand. So if you look at the experience from uh, the University of Missouri right down the road, uh, when they hired a chief diversity officer. Uh, I think back in 2015, after some very heated campus protests, you've seen pretty much consistently over the next nine, eight years, uh, African-American uh, enrollment plummet, despite the fact that the chief diversity officer has always been black. This isn't just a one-time thing. Um, a team of researchers from Baylor uh, and the National Bureau of Economic Researchers, they looked at the hiring of chief diversity officers on American universities from 2001 to 2019, and they found there was no change in pre-existing trends. And what a trend analysis is, you know, d demographics change, so campuses change with them. They didn't see that it actually increased diversity or decreased, it just did nothing. Things stayed the same, more or less. So also a literature review and the annual review of psychology from uh, 2022, and this is all-encompassing. Uh, they looked at all of these studies on impacts, and the, and the conclusion they came to is, direct quote, that the enthusiasm, enthusiasm for a monetary investment in 
diversity training has outpaced the available evidence that such programs are effective in achieving their goals. So the problem with affirming loyalty oaths is that it also hurts the people that are trying to improve diversity. The reason that it hurts is because they're, when programs are ineffective, when strategies are ineffective, they're often afraid to come out and criticize them because they don't want to be labeled as racist. Thank you for being here. Do you think that it harms our universities to remove these programs that are already in place, the oath and, and the loyalty oath and then the DEI? So some voices say that it hurts faculty recruitment, um, it hurts student appeal. Uh, there's no evidence of that. Uh, the University of Texas, for example, just had record um, applications. Uh, the new College of Florida, which a lot of people have uh, maybe read about in the news as a flashpoint in this, this so-called DEI culture war, they also just had record high um, applications and also their African-American enrollment increased. It did not decrease. And uh, the University of Florida system has seen a uh, spike in enrollment all around. And UNC is kind of in the same position uh, in North Carolina. So there's just no evidence that, that these policies help or hurt um, in terms of students. With faculty, I tend to be to believe they do not hurt because I don't, that's just the way the university system works. Once you get on a 10 year track, you're not really quick to give that up for, for petty uh, political squabbles. So you usually don't see them run for the hills as some would predict. Thank you so much. Further questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here this morning. Further witnesses to testify in support? Please proceed when ready. Good morning, Chairman Squared and members of the committee. For the record, James Harris, uh, representing Cicero Action, here to testify in support of uh, Senate Bill 1125. You know, the one thing I think this is a, a discussion worth having is we're very fortunate in the United States that we have the best higher education institutions in the world. But something is changing on these campuses and where they're trying to stifle out opinions they don't like. And one of the best things about college is a time where you can learn, you can explore, you can exchange ideas. Uh, I, in college, served on, on our student lecture committee and we brought Lady Thatcher, Charlton Heston, and Bill Buckley to campus. Charlton Heston was president of the NRA at the time. That was a little controversial. And I remember they were protesters and they came inside and sat in the front row. But it was a good time to, for us all to talk, learn, have different opinions, and we weren't scorned we weren't shamed if you, you know if you had you believed in the Second Amendment in that discussion or you had a different opinion, and that's not the case now. And something needs to be done to to stop some of this stuff. Otherwise, in ten or twenty years, our institutions will not be as good. We will have weaker medical programs uh, because as you put all this stuff in, just think about it. Something has to go out. There's only so many hours in a day. So if you put more of the DEI and the loyalty oath and hey, let's read some books that say whatever, something's going out, and that's disturbing. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, further witnesses testify in support? Seeing none, witnesses testify in opposition? Please proceed when ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Sharon Galway-Jones here today on behalf of the Missouri State Conference of the NAACP and Promo Missouri. Um, I think that the part to focus on here is that this isn't about loyalty oaths. This is about also unsolicited statements. That would include essays that students are writing as part of the admissions process and it would tend to disadvantage then students who aren't able to share their full life story for fear of running afoul of this. For example, if you are someone who grew up in a disadvantaged neighborhood, uh, went to a school that was majority free and reduced lunch, that sort of thing, at what point are you going to run afoul of this if in sharing your story as a way to try to get scholarships, to try to get admission, that sort of thing? That, that would be our main concern. Um, I also think that it's very important to recognize that we are living in a very fraught time 
and finding ways to have discussions about ways to treat each other civilly is important. I, I don't think that anyone should be required to stand up and swear an oath. I don't think that they are being required to stand up and swear an oath. I think they're being required to say that they will not discriminate when they're on campus. So for those reasons, we oppose the bill, and hopefully I've hit all the points so no one else has to do it. Thank you for that testimony. Any questions for this witness from the committee? Seeing none, thank, thank you again you. for being here. Further witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, my name is Paul Wagner. I'm the Executive Director of the Council on Public Higher Education. I represent all the public universities outside of the University of Missouri system. Um, well, the first thing I would mention about these loyalty oaths is that we don't have them. Um, the bill says we can't have loyalty oaths. We don't have loyalty oaths as a condition of uh, admission or doing business with the university or uh, being hired by the university. Um, so maybe they do in the Ivy League or something, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been presented with one single example of this happening in Missouri. Um, I have the feeling that people are looking really hard for them. Um, and if they were out there, if we were doing this, you'd probably have a catalog of examples in front of you. I don't know that you have any examples. Um, however, we still... Um, oppose the bill simply because um, it's really an open encouragement to uh, litigation. There's some very poorly defined or undefined terms in here, um, such as marginalized groups. I don't, we don't, that's not a defined term. We don't know what is or isn't a marginalized group or when it says things like or related concepts. No idea what concepts may or may not be related to um, the other things that are listed. Um, so for the simple fact that even if we're complying with the law, we would be open to all manner of, of litigation um, based on these vague and undefined terms, we cannot support the bill. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that testimony. Questions for this witness from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you again for being here. For the witnesses in opposition. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kaina Iman. On behalf of the Missouri Nurses Association, we are concerned about um, the actual violation that's outlined in the bill. That would, uh, if someone brought. Um, a complaint against a fa faculty member at one of our public nursing schools, they would not be able, they would be ineligible for employment for a year and also unable to work in any other institution in the state. So based on Mr. Wagner's comments that some of the phrases are not well defined, we're concerned about that. Thank you for that testimony. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you again for being here. Further witnesses in opposition? Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Jeff Smith representing the American Civil Liberties Union of Missouri. We have 15,000 members uh, across the state, and I am here uh, representing them in opposition to this bill. Um, first, would like to associate ourselves with the testimony, the previous testimony in particular, the testimony from uh, the representative from the NAACP regarding um, statements. Uh, in applications to, for admission. Also would like to associate our, com, uh, ourselves with the comments from the Missouri N Nurses Association with regard to, the, to the, what we see as exceedingly uh, unclear parameters of the legislation and the very harsh potential penalties of barring people from employment uh, at uh, Missouri universities for a year. I'll just close by saying that in uh, over 15 years of teaching public policy, um, at universities both in Missouri uh, and in the Ivy League as well, was never asked to submit anything approximating a loyalty oath. I was asked to submit statements um, you know, that would, I think, probably fall in this category of DEI, but they were merely um, requesting that 
uh, that um, an applicant talk about ways in which their own experience with diverse populations might inform their teaching, inform their research, inform their service at a university uh, to be a better you know, community member and, and citizen of, uh, uh, on a campus. So there was nothing kind of approximating a loyalty oath, but merely uh, a question asking, you know, just um, a request for a statement uh, to offer perspective on, you know, um, how one deals with uh, people that may not look like themselves or believe the same things that, that the applicant believes. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <coughs> questions for this witness from the committee? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you again for being here. Further witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Ryan DeBoof. I am registered lobbyist for Missouri State University. I was not planning to testify. I did want to clarify one thing that Mr. Wagner said. He indicated there had been no instances of this happening. I wanted to uh, go on the record to let you know there was a record of this happening several years ago. Uh, Missouri State University had a search consultant that had required this as part of a search for a position. Uh, a news report came out about that. Uh, if you know our president, President Cliff Smart, he was not pleased when he found out about this, got to the bottom of it, put an end to it as quickly as we found out about it. So happy to answer any questions about that. Any questions for this witness from the committee? Seeing none, yes. thank you again for being here. Further witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Otto Fagan on behalf of Missouri NEA. Uh, just want to go on record in opposition to express the, the concern that, and this is spoken to somewhat by Mr. Wagner, the wording of the bill is such that it's difficult to interpret when you're in compliance and it may spread out to other legitimate purposes. For example, uh, a, a college may want to be uh, proactive in making sure that it's doing things to encourage employment in under, uh, underrepresented populations within the community. And so this bill might call into question, because of the way it's worded, uh, because it's kind of overbroad, whether or not those sorts of efforts could be uh, permitted. And so for those reasons, we would discourage the committee from advancing the bill. Happy to answer questions. Yes, Senator Koenig. So we've kind of, so we've kind of uh, heard this repeatedly, that Maybe the concept is in the bill is not bad, but just the wording of the bill. Are you against the concept of the bill, or is it, or? I don't know that the concept of the bill, kind of taken on its face, matters that much, because there, there, as, the, as some of the previous witnesses have spoken, there's no, uh, there's no practice of oaths. The, it, the, the concern we have is the spillover into other legitimate things that, you know, under federal guidelines for opportunity, both public and private employers are, are within their rights, and if you're a federal contractor, there's an expectation that you're trying to make sure that you have some degree of openness to employment across broad specters of the, of the community. We just don't want that to be interfered with. Further questions for the bill, or for the uh, witness here? <laughs> Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again for being here. And we're going to pause real briefly and call the roll uh, so that we can establish a quorum and then we'll resume uh, the hearing. With that, uh, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Senators Trent? Here. Coleman? Arthur? Beck? Brown? Here. Carter? Fitzwater? Gannon? Here. Koenig? Here. Razor? Here. Thompson Raider? Quorum having been established, we'll resume uh, testimony. Next witness in opposition, please come forward. Proceed when ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is David Lee Brush. I'm with Missouri Equity Education Partnership Action, and we would like to echo the sentiments in opposition to this bill. Uh, pretty much everyone has said nearly everything we had planned to say, which is great. Um, but we would like to add that we feel that this is going to impact teacher education programs, um, and in a in a negative way. And 
because representation matters in education and it could lead to a problem in teacher recruitment and teacher retention and impact the teacher shortage already in existence in Missouri. And there are certain um, kinds of education that when it's taught, they are required to um, train, provide professional development in diversity, equity, and education. And that's going to be difficult if their universities where they are are not um, able to um, focus some, t some of the time on DEI concepts. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Further witnesses in opposition? Seeing none, are there any witnesses here to testify for informational purposes only? Oh, are you in opposition? Sorry, I didn't realize you were coming up. Please proceed. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, Chase Campbell, uh, representing National Association of Social Workers. Uh, nothing beyond what's already been said, Dad. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you again for being here. Further witnesses in opposition? Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Calloway. I am a pharmacist, uh, practicing pharmacist in the state of Missouri. Actually, I'm retired. And I just wanted to speak in opposition to the bill. Uh, one of the, the things that I think I bring personally, and I'm not speaking on behalf of an organization, an institution, or, or any other group other than myself personally and my experience as a pharmacist, is that we are, uh, pharmacy is an underrepresented profession when it comes to minorities. Uh, in the profession and as I came through pharmacy school one of the things that I appreciated is that you know you can be pretty smart to get in pharmacy school but the meritocracy in terms of getting into pharmacy school has prevented over the years the number of persons from entering the profession personally for me I can tell you that having worked 37 years at the University of Missouri uh, and served as a pharmacist for almost 50 years uh, here in Missouri when our patients see someone who looks like them, it makes a huge difference in how they respond to the recommendations and the information that you're presenting to them. So my point, my sharing information with you is simply that efforts to uh, reduce diversity and inclusion uh, in the state don't serve the parents and children of our citizens in the state and it certainly doesn't serve the persons who uh, are in need of seeing someone more people who look like me and others appear before them uh, in terms of providing health care for them the ability of institutions to be able to uh, assemble a team if you will uh, that wants to focus on diversity uh, is critically important. All of the major pharmacy organizations have all committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And while we haven't made tremendous strides, I would say that we have made some strides, definitely. Have we solved the problem of lack of diversity in, our, in this profession? No, we have not. But I would submit to you that efforts uh, that are anti-diversity, anti-DEI, don't help address the problem of uh, getting more disadvantaged persons, more persons who look like me and others uh, into the profession. So I would just like to share that with you, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to be here to share my personal perspective. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, Senator Koenig. So um, how are people, you said certain people are prevented or makes it hard for them to get into pharmacy, become a pharmacist? Yes, yeah, so uh, here's my personal experience. Um, I used to be part of a, um, uh, a screening process for admissions to a pharmacy school. You had to pretty much have a 3.5 GPA, and many students who in pharmacy admissions were very, very competitive, and we've seen a decrease in admissions to pharmacy schools just because of more pharmacy schools. and. And, and that sort of thing. Used to be you had to have a 3.5 or better to get in. And that was the criteria that got you to the next stage of even getting an interview. So the ability to be considered more holistically, to be considered 
on a basis other than just simply do you have an adequate grade point average, and then thinking about the equity aspect of what does it mean to get into pharmacy school and to get through pharmacy school. When I went to pharmacy school, we didn't have remediation. We have remediation now for students who need a little extra help, and that's really the, the, the standard on nearly any campus that really wants to serve I mean, it students. Sounds like, it sounds like you're kind of against universal standards. I mean, I, I know mm -hmm. if, if, if I'm, um, you know, getting medical care somewhere, whether it's a pharmacist or a doctor, um, I want the best qualified person, not uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. That, 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 that's not what I want as a consumer. It's not what I should want um, as someone who's receiving medical care. Um, so like this, you're kind of proving the point that the diversity, equity, inclusion should really just go away. It has no bearing, no merit um, in the medical field at all. Yeah, no, not at all. I disagree with you very strongly. Uh, diversity and equity has a huge impact and importance when it comes to caring for our populations. We have health gaps right now when it comes to uh, taking care of persons and the disproportionate effects of health care on persons of color, disadvantaged persons. And so while, yes, allowing admissions, and this is not about admissions necessarily, but assembling a team that values the diversity of the applicant, of the student, of the faculty member, of the administrator, that's critically important because at the point that you, you're not saying the person is not qualified to do that. Not at all. Well, you said you, you said you want to get rid of standards. No, sir, I did not say that. I did not say I want to get rid of standards. Not at all. Well, I, mean, I have pulled myself to the highest standard of practice well, in the you. profession. I'm not trying to get rid of standards. Well, you, you I'm said. saying I'd like to have more persons in the profession coming through pharmacy schools, coming through general higher education. I'd like to have more persons that are aware of the issues that are specific and related to persons of color, disadvantaged persons, LGBT, all of the different groups that are part of our state, that are part of our communities, that are part of the United States. That's all I'm saying is that I think it's not an or, by getting rid of it's standards. an and. We're gonna do that by getting it's an rid of and. standards? No, not at all getting rid of standards. No, I am not advocating getting rid of standards. <coughs> pharmacy schools didn't change their standards. They did not change their standards. Said, Medical you schools you said didn't they were change. Rid it. Of the GPAs. No, sir, I did not say that. You said they, that they had. You had to, in order to get into pharmacy school, you had to get a 3.5 or above, and they got rid of that. No, sir, I did not say that. I said that that was only one criteria that was considered. And along with other criteria, in addition to like GPAs. What, like what, what kind of criteria? So for instance, a person's lived experience. What part of the country do they come from? What part of the community do they come from? Well, that's kind of uh, just, what that's do they bring to, the, to, the, the, to benefit the school uh, institution that they want to be a part of? I'm not advocating getting rid of standards at all, sir. Additional questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any further witnesses in opposition? Seeing none. Any witnesses here to testify for informational purposes only? Seeing none. That will conclude the public hearing on Senate Bill 1125. Uh, Senator, would you have some closing remarks? Yeah. I just want to address one of the uh, concerns that seemed to uh, have been raised by a couple of people that testified in opposition. Just to uh, make clear that this, this does not address curriculum. So uh, There were concerns expressed that if a professor you know, said the wrong thing that you know, they could be end up in a bad situation and disciplinary action could be taken against them. This is only for the state DEI statements as a condition of employment. So it does not address what happens in the classroom. Also, uh, there is a claim that this is not happening. I have three examples. It took me about 10 minutes. I found three uh, listings, UMSL, uh, Missouri State, UMKC, where they are requiring 
as part well, along with the application <coughs> a DEI <coughs> statement. So it is happening. I have evidence of it right here. I'd be happy to provide for the committee. I'm sure if I spent another 10 minutes, I could probably uh, come up with a number of others. And uh, once again, just want to thank the committee for the opportunity to present. Thank you for those closing remarks. That will conclude the public hearing on Senate Bill 1125. No additional business coming before the committee. We are adjourned.